Thank you so much, uh, Lalit. I really appreciate you taking the time to join us today. We run lots of these webinars uh, that we offer to our community for no charge. And uh, it's an interesting learning experience that we've been, we have been offering for about 10 years now. And as part of our uh, programs that we run, we also run lots of youth programs like Lego Robotics, like Entrepreneurship Boot Camps, coding programs, Python, AIML. We just wrapped a, a summer long coding program for our youth. Uh, and we were essentially teaching Python, JavaScripting and, uh, and AIML. So this is what we have been doing for many, many years now, but it's, uh, it's, uh, we are very happy to introduce uh, Lalit Kapoor. Uh, Lalit Kapoor has been uh, uh, talking about a new plant-based whole food diet approach to life. And it's a lifestyle as well as a diet approach that uh, has been able to fix some of the chronic diseases. And, uh, and uh, in all transparency, I'm currently on that diet because I was quite impressed with uh, Lalit's uh, seminar at the, at the ICC. And uh, uh, truly speaking, I was there for a couple hours and I said, because I had a packed day and I was going to leave, but I was transfixed with what Lalit was talking about. Ended up staying the whole day until 5 p.m. listening to all the case studies and the very unique approach to fine tuning how we approach health. Uh, and uh, the net of it is, you know, we can, continue to pop medicines and uh, we can uh, rely upon uh, big pharma, which is, which is actually good in some ways, but there is an alternate approach in terms of what we can do to, to make our life healthy with simple slight tweaks. And uh, Lalit uh, talks about it much better than I can ever do. So Lalit, it's a pleasure to have you. And uh, let's turn over the mic to you and uh, and what we'll do is uh, from a standpoint of how we'll run this session, uh, please send your questions on the chat window as, we, uh, as Lalit is walking through the, the presentation and we'll pick up the questions at the very end. And hopefully what is likely gonna happen is as Lalit uh, walks through his program, you will get your questions may be answered. Uh, so without any further ado, let's have uh, Lalit Kapoor take on the stage and walk through his program. Thank you so much, Lalit, for taking the time. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Rishi, for the introduction. And welcome, everyone. Um, eight years ago, I, um, I watched a documentary, Forks Over Knives, and uh, it resonated with me, and, and I changed my, <clears throat> my diet, my eating habits, <clears throat> and lost 50 pounds. I was able to get off five different medications I was taking at the time for diabetes, hypertension, gout, thyroid, sleep apnea, uh, the, the mask I was asked to sleep with a mask on, and uh, osteoarthritis. And, uh, and I have been sharing what I learned. I, I spent four years learning about how diet matters. And how when we, when we change our diet, our body begins to heal. The slide that you're looking at the, at the screen of two people mopping a kitchen floor um, while the faucet is running and kitchen sink is clogged. Uh, it represents what is happening in the medical industry today. Our, um, our detoxification systems are clogged. We are not able to detoxify our body. And we continue to consume food, which is toxic. And we are only worried about mopping the floor. We are not paying attention to declogging and turning off the faucet. So what I'm going to talk about today is uh, that it is the diet and the lifestyle which is cause of most chronic diseases. So if that is the cause of most chronic diseases, if you just change your diet and lifestyle, the disease goes away. It's as simple as that. And 
And when I spent uh, hours doing research into it, that the thing became very clear that uh, somehow in last uh, one century after antibiotics were in, developed back in 1928, 93 years ago, at that time, our biggest enemy was infectious diseases, you know, cholera and, and uh, smallpox, uh, typhoid. These were our, our biggest concerns. And uh, antibiotic pills worked very well. So somehow over those three, four decades, we developed this psyche. When ill, just take a pill but it didn't work. It didn't work uh, when it came to diseases which were caused by lifestyle and diet. So, so to the doctors came to the rescue and they said, well, these are incurable diseases. And because they are incurable diseases, we will just help you maintain them. Don't expect recovery. And, and that's what we have been following for last five decades. We are taking pills for hypertension, taking pills for diabetes, pills for cholesterol, and all the diseases. The focus is only on pills. And then pills don't work, then they go to procedures and uh, kidney transplants or liver transplant or artificial pancreas. And the problem keeps getting worse and worse. All right, so I want to assure all of you that all your chronic problems, and we are not talking about congenital problem you were born with or infectious problem like uh, COVID-19, or an acute problem, you are in an accident and you break your bones. For those things, the medical science is great. It has done tremendous progress and, and, and they can do open heart surgeries or brain surgeries, uh, join your broken bones very well. But when it comes to simple things as blood pressure, they or, or blood sugar, they have failed miserably. And, and my experience has shown, and now I have uh, over 20,000 uh, members who follow me on WhatsApp or Facebook or Telegram, and they all are getting off their medications. And I, I want to make that point that, that there are no exceptions. They all, all those who follow get off these medications. All right, so we'll move to see if I have prepared a slide presentation is the second slide. <clears throat> Reversing chronic diseases, that's what we are talking today. And uh, why not turn off the faucet? We just discussed that, how development of penicillin in 1928 changed our psyche. We discussed that, take a pill when ill and how it doesn't work anymore. Uh, the third point that I want to make, uh, a general point is that you all are familiar with the, the table of elements where we have uh, all the, the, the chemical uh, names for, for all the elements that we know about. It was developed in 1871 by a Russian chemist called Dmitri. And, and Dmitri Meliniev um, created the first element table, which had 28 elements. When I was studying, and many of you, uh, depending on your age, when I was studying in 1960s, there were 100 elements. And today, there are 118 elements. The four more elements were added in 2016. So the science keeps evolving. 
Now, there are two types of people. When, when something new is found, some people feel elated and they take a position that till yesterday I did not know everything, but today I know everything. That's one group of people, they, they become a little uh, overconfident of their knowledge, almost to the point of being cocky. The other wise people who feel humbled, every time a new discovery is made, it is a reminder to them, there is a lot more to be known than what I know today. And, and Shakespeare had this quote, which, which I have modified here, that a fool thinks he knows it all, Whatever is there to be known, he knows it. Whereas a wise man is aware of the fact that what he knows is only a tiny portion of what is there to be known. So when we look at science or the discoveries of science, we need to be, to be um, modest and, and humbled about it to say that, well, what I know today is not all. There's a lot that I do not know. And, and we should not blunder based on the knowledge we have. Almost 50 years ago, doctors in America were at a point that they started saying the mother's milk is unhealthy for a baby. All babies should be fed with formula milk. It may sound strange to you, but that is a fact. About five decades ago, that was the thinking that mother's milk is not the best milk for, for a baby and a formula is a better milk. And we know better now. So, so we are all playing with a partial deck of cards. We don't have a full deck and we need to keep that in mind. Proof is in the pudding. I have, I have over thousand testimonials of people who have recovered from chronic diseases and stopped medications. And I keep receiving them practically every day. I create a new group on the first of each month and about 3000 people join every month. And by the time we finish the course in 60 days, many of them report getting off medications. So whatever I'm going to talk about as simple as it is, does work. We can make two observations about human evolution. Our bodies have evolved over millions of years, eating whatever was available. We used to move from one tree to the other without coming down in the forest because if we came down on the ground, there were predators which would kill us. As the forest has spread and trees became further apart, we had to walk between one tree and the other. And we started walking. Slowly that distance increased and we started walking more. And, and we started walking on hind legs that was more efficient. We ate whatever we found, we ate fruits, we ate roots. And then as we started walking on hind legs, we started finding some wild grains, wild rice, grasses that we ate. Sugar cane is type of a grass that we ate. So we ate food as it grew, as it was available to us. Um, even today in the forest, you find animals living a life and with, with natural food, and there are no hospitals in the forest. They, yes, they are uh, concerned about predators, but otherwise they live their full life. When we look at our uh, pets, the dogs and cats we keep at our home, and we give them packaged food, and we find that they need to see a vet uh, once in a while. They need to go to a clinic and we have to give them medication. The same situation that is happening with human beings. Before you heal someone, 
ask him if he's willing to give up the things that made him sick. And that's what we are talking about. This seminar will be no good if you don't make a change. You have to give up the foods that are making you sick. <clears throat> there are certain myths floating around and they've been there for generations. Some myths uh, are propagated by vested interests. And I'm going to talk about just five of them here to give you, to explain to you my point of view. One myth is that you must eat everything in moderation. The problem with that myth is when you eat everything in moderation, you get disease in moderation as well. Now, most of us feel resigned to these diseases. We think these are diseases of the old age. So we think coughing because of COPD or other lung disease is just a disease of old age and is to be expected. Or arthritic pain is a disease of old age and is to be expected. Hypertension is disease of old age. It doesn't have to be. It is, uh, when you look at blue zones around the world, there are five areas in the world that we have researched and we find that people are living there to be 100, 105, 110 year old and continuing to lead a normal life. They have no hospitals in those areas. They don't have any gymnasiums very few doctors. So there are areas like that, we call them blue zones. And we learn from them that the body does not have to become sick with age. We should be able to live the last five years of our life whenever they come normally, perfectly normally, without being on any medication, without the need for going to see clinics and doctors. And that is what we are talking about. The goal of modifying your diet and lifestyle is to live the last five years of your life disease-free. Whenever they come, when they come is not in our hand. Whenever they come, but you should be living till the last day of your life a perfectly normal life. There's a myth called protein myth, which I want to discuss because it's one of the most important to clarify before we move forward. This protein was discovered in, 19, in, in 1838, and it was discovered at that time in animal food. Protein is very important, but just because something is very important doesn't, need, doesn't mean that you need to eat a lot of it. And what we have started doing and the meat industry, dairy industry, egg industry, fisheries industry. These foods are very high in protein. Now the problem is that human body has no way of storing protein. Human body can store fat almost indefinite amount under our layer. We can store some sugar up to 2000 calories, 500 grams of sugar in our liver and muscles. But we have no organ, no way of storing protein. So when you eat protein in excess, body has to convert it into fat by removing nitrogen from it. The difference between protein structure and carbohydrate or fat is that protein has nitrogen element in it. So when you remove that nitrogen, it becomes ammonia, NH3. One, one atom of nitrogen combines with three atoms of hydrogen to make NH3, which is ammonia. Ammonia is very toxic. So your body combines ammonia with water to make uric acid. And uric acid then gets filtered in our kidneys and we pee it out as urine. That's where the word urine comes from. So when we eat more protein, we are taxing our liver and kidney unnecessarily. 
because it's going to get converted into fat anyway. You could have just eaten the fat, or it gets converted into into carbohydrate or sugar. So eating extra protein makes absolutely no sense. You might as well just eat extra fat and sugar, and you will be fine. So your kidney and liver will be saved. And this is the one reason we are seeing a lot of dialysis centers, people going for dialysis because their kidneys are beginning to fail. Because after we settled after Second World War, all the European and the Western countries focused on providing more food to the people. The food is the most satisfying thing in life. And, and so their focus shifted on providing more and more food. And that food came with high protein. And that is what we are now experiencing. And, and people are going to dialytic centers. And, and that industry is growing rapidly. Okay. Similarly, there are myths related to dairy. The dairy, the cow's milk was intended for a cow's baby, a calf which grew in weight in, in, in three months from 40 pounds to 400 pounds. Human child does not grow at that pace. Human child in three to four months only doubles his weight from maybe eight to 16 pounds. So cow's milk was not intended for human babies and mother's milk was. In fact, human mother's milk has only five and a half percent protein. And the US government research had shown that we only need minimum of five to six percent protein, but they recommended eight to 10%. And somehow the industry changed that eight to 10% from recommended daily allowance to minimum daily allowance. And they started saying, well, that's the minimum. You should really should be eating 20%, 25%. Could that serve the interest of the meat and dairy industry? And, and, and that's what, why that myth has been propagated. Everybody say, oh, protein is very important and you should eat protein. It's flawed. It is important, but you should not eat more protein. It is very harmful. There's also an exercise myth. A lot of young people have that myth that I work out. I go to gym every day and I work out for two hours. What wrong could happen to me? And the research has shown that diet and absence of diet, which is fasting, accounts for 80% of your health. The 20% is everything else put together. So exercise is not a solution for your dietary problems. Another myth is better safe than sorry. People say, oh, I just take a tiny pill for my, an eye, for my blood pressure or for my blood sugar. And they think that taking that tiny pill is being safe. And that is a myth that pill is doing you more harm in ways that you do not even know. So people are now beginning to realize that it is safer to let your blood pressure go up a little bit more than to control it by heavy medication. Okay, let's see next. So there are five uh, pillars of health, as I call them, which are very important. Uh, food, detoxification, physical activity, emotional activity and spiritual balance, emotional support and spiritual balance. So in food, our focus needs to be on eating plant-based whole food. Here I'm in this slide, I'm showing you what is the difference between whole food and a processed or refined food. And that is one area where we have gone haywire. So when you eat a corn on the cob, that is how the food was intended to be eaten. Okay, you can keep that corn 
and 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 as frozen and make a corn soup and that is also acceptable you can eat corn meal you can eat corn flour corn starch and you can even eat popcorn these are all whole food nothing has been removed when you eat corn flakes this is highly processed food into which some other chemicals have been added when you eat corn oil you have removed the fiber and process the corn to generate corn oil and corn oil is not healthy they also make what we call high fructose corn syrup which is added in place of sugar to all beverages and soft drinks and many food items and it is very harmful so one needs to try and eat food in its whole form or as close to the whole form as one can the difference is if you can process with your own hands or with primitive tools like you can slice it dice it peel it mash it all that is allowed but if you are going to remove the fiber from it to make corn oil that is not allowed so all i am saying is that you need to eat plant based whole food and not refined food eat corn not corn oil eat peanuts not peanut oil eat olives and not olive oil and so on here is a typical daily meal plan of a indian vegetarian they start at 7 in the morning with the tea with milk and sugar some biscuits or rusk with it breakfast at 9 o'clock some aloo paratha or poha upma with with uh, some lassi or lemonade or another cup of tea so more sugar and dairy is coming in there at lunch you have dal and sabji some yogurt dish raita rice and some mithai with it in the evening some samosa and tea or sherbat roo afza or something like that if you consume alcohol then at 8 o'clock you like to have some namkeen or fried cashews or matki with your alcohol you eat dinner late 9:30 is very common time frame in india to have dinner and there again you have one uh, dairy based dish like raita or and then some mithai which may also often be dairy based so we are eating from 7 in the morning till 9:30 at dinner and i have not included the last glass of milk many people consume before going to bed like at 10:30 or 11 o'clock so when you look at this food you see that there's a lot of consumption of ghee and oil a lot of consumption of sugar and essentially you are getting two third of your calories from oil ghee sugar and dairy now these are mostly empty calories so that's where our problem lies that we are not getting the right nutrients because we are consuming food which is calorie rich and nutrient poor what if we could just reverse it and that's all i am talking about okay if we can take out these two third of the calories from this diet and add to them green leafy vegetables vegetable juices fruits uh, nuts and seeds you have achieved your health it's as simple as that but you consume everything which is in whole food form plant based whole food form and another thing is try to drink you instead of drinking your water try to eat your water as much as possible so watermelon is 91% water cucumbers are 98% water so throughout your day except for the morning when you get up you should have two glasses of warm water and then after dinner you don't want to eat anything and you want to have maybe a glass of water but rest of the day as much as possible 
instead of drinking water, eat your water by eating such fruits and vegetables which are rich in water. So one of the ways to consume large quantities of green leafy vegetables is by making juice. And here is a juice recipe. So you see different green leafy vegetables, shard and kale. There's a bottle gourd, loki is there, uh, celery is there, lettuce, cucumber, granny smith apples, lemon, ginger, and beetroot. And I recommend people that they make juice out of it. It's the second best choice. Of course, the best is to eat them raw as salad. But that's not convenient for many people. They can have only one plate of salad, one bowl of salad. So if you make a green juice, I recommend that you take a glass of green juice before every meal. A, depending upon your size, if your size is small, take a small glass. If you are extra large, six feet three like Amitabh Bachchan, you take an extra large glass of juice. So Jaya Badri should have a extra small glass of juice and Amitabh should have an extra large glass of juice. But have a juice 15, 20 minutes before every meal. That's one of my recommendations. Now I want to talk about uh, circadian rhythm. Uh, 2017 Nobel Prize was given to scientists who demonstrated how human beings, all cells in human beings follow a circadian rhythm, which is similar to the day and night, 12 hour daylight and 12 hour night on, on earth. And not only humans, all animals, all mammals follow a circadian rhythm. So every cell in our body operates on a 24 hour circadian rhythm. We have a master clock, which is a pacemaker, which dictates the pace, sends a signal to all 30 trillion cells about the timing. And that master clock resides in our brain right under hypothalamus. All body cells are synchronized to that master clock. If the master clock is misaligned, every cell will be misaligned. And our body will be releasing hormones at, at wrong timing. So almost uh, half of our chronic problems can get resolved if we just align our rhythm, our circadian rhythm to our nature's rhythm. The problem has come in the last 150 years. Once we, electricity was invented, and we were able to work uh, in the nighttime or very early morning because of artificial light. Um, our eyes are sensitized by a protein called melanopsin. We have about 5,000 melanopsin cells in each retina. And they sense the morning light, the light that comes from the sky, reflected light. Is, is blue and our eyes sense them and they then recognize the morning has happened. They increase the level of cortisol hormone in our body. They bring down, they bring down melatonin hormone. And in the evening after sunset, as the sky becomes darker, the cortisol hormone is supposed to decline and melatonin is supposed to go up. But if you are working late and especially watching TV or watching a computer screen or your cell phone is screen, they emit blue light. So your circadian rhythm gets out of sync. It begins to think it's still daytime. So instead of releasing melatonin, at seven o'clock in the evening, it delays release of melatonin to maybe 10 o'clock. Now melatonin is that helps you fall asleep. It, it calms you down, gets you ready for sleep. 
See, we cannot sleep at will. We can only prepare ourselves to sleep. The sleep then comes. So similarly, if the melatonin is not being released in sufficient quantities, we are not going to fall asleep. And if we were watching a TV till 10 o'clock or working on our laptop or cell phone, and then if we go to sleep, we will have a hard time sleeping till 11 o'clock. And that's part of our problem in the modern world. Similarly, if we eat food, after it is dark outside, our body thinks it is still daylight and it goes out of whack. Similarly, some young people go to gym, work out at 11 o'clock at night. That is not natural and it confuses your circadian clock. I encourage all of you to go to YouTube. There's Dr. Sachin Panda at University of California at San Diego, who is doing a lot of research in this area. And he has demonstrated that if we could just bring people's circadian clock in sync with the nature's clock, almost half of our problems can be solved. So in 2016, the Nobel Prize was given to Dr. Yoshinori for his research on fasting. And he demonstrated that when we do not get food for some extended period of time, um, like 16 hours, our body changes its metabolic pathway from sugar burning mode to fat burning mode. And when body does not get enough protein, it begins to recycle protein within our cells. Every cell in our body has a, like a trash can or lysosome. So it is spent protein is kept in that trash, in that trash can. When we do not get new protein coming in our body during fasting period, the body begins to recycle and it can be seen under microscope. It's very amazing that every cell in your body begins to do healing or detoxification. Okay. So that's what was demonstrated in 2016 Nobel Prize. And this combined with Dr. Sachin Panda's work and the other work for which 2017 Nobel Prize was given, suggests that we should eat all our meals in a narrow window of eight to 10 hours. And that window should be a daylight window. So you can have your meals from 10 in the morning till six in the evening, for example, that's an eight hour window. And that is the healthiest time frame to consume meals. Now, another research that got 2018 Nobel Prize to Dr. Honzo demonstrated that when we fast for longer periods, not a one day fast or a Ekadashi fast, which is like 36 hour fast. When we do fast such as Navratri fast for nine days, then our body develops immunity, immunity to cancer, immunity to other diseases, because body goes into the mode of preservation. The cells get hardened to survive. The body, for the time being, stops worrying about procreation and, and, and focuses on conservation, conservation and maintaining health. So people who are suffering from cancer, rather than offering them as we currently do, or the doctors currently recommend that have chicken soup or some healthy high protein diet, which is totally counterintuitive. And Dr. Honzo has suggested that you need to help these people fast. And if they would fast for five days, every month, 
And to make the fasting easy, they allow them to have maybe one meal a day, a small 500 calorie meal, which is low in protein. That's the most important thing. And so there's a lot of interesting research is going on that many of us are not aware of. The Navratri fast will be starting next week. And Navratri fast is totally consistent with the research that got 2018 Nobel Prize to Dr. Honzo. By keeping fast for nine days and having a single meal in the early evening of 500 calories or less, we rejuvenate our body. And if we do that once a year, you would not fall ill. So, so there are three fasting routines. One is a daily fast for 14 to 16 hours. We call it intermittent fasting. Second is a fast every two weeks, which we call in India, Ekadashi fasting. You skip your food for whole day and then eat the normal breakfast on the third day. So it, the total gap becomes 36 hours. And then the third is the nine day fast once or twice a year in April and October or only October. And I suggest that, I suggest you follow all three fasting routines. So here is in summary is what I suggest if you it's, it's, uh, there are 14 guidelines. If you just follow those 14 guidelines, you don't have to listen to anything else and you will see your health uh, recover within days. I'm not talking about within months. You will see by third day, you will begin to notice the changes. So number one, no animal food, no eggs and no dairy, no yogurt, cheese, milk, mithai or anything. Number two, no refined or highly processed food. So no oil or sugar. You can have uh, nuts from which the oil is made or you can have sugar cane and that's fine. You can eat sugar cane or gandheri, but not refined sugar. You can replace sugar with what we call dates. So you can put dates into your mithai or kheer or, or desserts. And there are many dates, uh, many desserts can be made with dates, dates and nuts, but no sugar. Eat from all five food groups and eat herbs and spices as much as you like. They're very important. Eat at least 1% of your body weight in fruits and it must include berries, all the berries. So consume a cup of berries every day. And this is minimum. If you're trying to reverse a, a, a serious condition, and this one can be one and a half percent. Eat a minimum one percent of your body weight in vegetables, and half of which half of which um, okay. Something has happened here. Okay. Uh, wow. Okay. I. Um, I'm sorry. I. I. I need help here and I have nobody to help me out. Um, and, uh, but I will, I will continue with the dialogue. Um, let's see if I can, okay. So try to click first tab. Yeah, I am not able to. Um, get back to my slides. Something happened. The command came and go up to the top left. Rishi, top left. What should I do? Now click on that. It says Rishi Kumar talk. Click on that. 
Rishi Kumar talk tab. Uh, on the on top? top. Go up, go up, left. Keep going up. Move your cursor up. Next to green, green next, dot. Right. Next. Go, go left another inch. Left here? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, up, up a little bit. There, yes. click on it. Click on it. There you go. Yeah, I'm clicking on it. And it is, it's, not, it's not letting this screen go. Okay. All right. Yeah, good. Thank you. Thank you. Please guide me if I go straight again. Okay. So uh, it's not showing the full slide. Okay. Anyway. Um, so, so you want to take uh, one percent of great uh, vegetables. You need to eat some uh, flax seed or chia seed or hemp seed to 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 get enough um, omega three. Uh, most of us don't get enough omega three, and that is a cause of several problems. Um, so just make it a habit of uh, eating some walnuts and any of the three seeds, flax, chia, or hemp seed. You can take one tablespoon and mix it in your oatmeal mix or in your atta to make uh, chapatis or in your, in your vegetable sabji preparation, uh, and, and that's fine. Vitamin B12 supplement you must take and no other supplement. Supplements don't help us, they, they hurt us. Vitamin B12 we have to take simply because we are, uh, uh, all, we are consuming municipal water and municipal water is chlorinated. So all vitamin B12 has been killed in the municipal water and uh, so for that reason, that's the one uh, supplement that needs to be consumed. Okay. Um, keep your body hydrated, have enough uh, water. Um, and as I said, two glasses in the morning, one glass after dinner at night. The rest of the day, you can have another two, three glasses, but I prefer that you get that water from uh, fruits and vegetables, watermelons or cucumbers. Or things like that. Nalaji, one second. Uh, if you, if you go I'm not able to get my next slide. Something yeah, is blocking me. If you, if you go up to the top and say view options, you see. Okay, I go to the top and view, yes. View options do fit the window. Can you do view the option, window? always show bookmark. No, always show window. toolbar, always show full URL. No, no, on, on, the, on the middle of the screen, on the top. Okay, middle screen. Oh. And on the top, uh, you see fit to window, view options on the presentation. Window. Fit to, fit to window. Picture window. One fit, fit to window, F-I-T to window. Oh, fix the window, okay. Fit, fit to window. Participant security chat. The very first option. Quick time player, file, edit, view, window, help. No, no, it, it's, it, do you see a green? It says uh, Lalit screen, uh, right next to it called view options. He doesn't see that? Okay. New share. Okay, I guess for some reason. I'm right. screen sharing right now. And now he's, you know, the thing is he's not able to see the full slide. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. I maybe have sir, it. maybe sir, click on this window where you are right now. Click on this window, okay. Yes, please. And then click on right arrow button from your laptop. On from, your, from your laptop. Keep keyboard, laptop keyboard. Oh keyboard. What shall I hit on? Okay. Escape? Right arrow. Right arrow button. Right arrow, okay. Just try that. Yeah. Is there a problem, Lilith? Yeah, there's a problem. Uh, that uh, the screen sharing went away. And, and this other screen has come. And my slide is not coming. We're only halfway I can through. see your diet and lifestyle guidelines, page one. 
Yeah, the, and and that that page uh, is not going to page two. If I when I click this because it's it is not filling the whole page, and uh, and I'm doing go forward. It's not going to the next slide. That's where I I'm stuck. Okay. So, are you on the right tab? Because you might have your slide deck on a different tab. Maybe is this your slide deck? No, I'm using Google Slide. Yes, yes. Is this your Google Slide deck, uh, the one with the the diet and lifestyle guidelines, page one? Is that uh, your? It's from Google Slide. Okay, so if you hit the down arrow, it should go to the next slide. Yeah, I. It's not. It's, it, I was hitting right arrow, and it was working till now. But now it is not working. It has hit the hit the escape uh, button. Escape, escape on your keyboard. Okay. okay. All right. Escape. Or do one thing: stop share and then share again. Stop share. Stop. Click share. at the very bottom. Stop share and then share again. Stop share. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. Now, I stop share sh now. Now sh share again and click. Uh, pick the right uh, tab which has the Google Slide Deck on your browser. Yeah, it came to that slide, but that slide is is not. Uh, covering the full screen as, and somehow the prompt is not working. It's not going from one slide to the next page. Uh, Lalit, can you please uh, share screen and, and select the slide deck? The share screen command is not coming. I don't know where to click to get the share screen. It's at the very bottom. You should have a share screen. Oh, bottom. Now it has gone somewhere totally. Maybe other sir, you can take the command from Lalit sir and then you can do that. Okay, I, um, you know, I have, um, I, I, I can talk. I don't know now the picture is also gone. I can't see anybody and somehow it has gone. I. Totally haywire. And yeah. Zoom sometimes iconizes uh, uh, in the uh, top right window. You know, it's it's usually funny if you can see the small icon of Zoom. Yeah, top I, right, then you can click it. I cannot see anything. I there is a. I'm seeing my email uh, has come here, and and some junk email is sitting. I, I think you may have minimized your browser. You just need to find the browser which has your slide deck. And how do you do that? Um, it's Murphy's law. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I can I can finish. I have a I have my uh, my iPhone, and I can finish uh, the conversation. I think you will not see the picture. I'm sorry. That sounds um, great. You know, we can just continue talking and yeah. we'll share so, the slide deck separately. So we were talking about uh, the guidelines and, and I talked about the eighth guideline was keep your body hydrated. The ninth is you need to practice 16 to eight hour intermittent fasting. Try to consume all your food in a narrow eight hour window. It can be from 10 to 6, 10 in the morning till 6 in the evening or 11 to 7. Whatever window you prefer, but try to have all your food within eight hour window, preferably. But, but if, you are, if you are healthy and you have no health issues, you're not trying to reverse the disease, then a 10 hour window is also fine. But if you are a diabetic or hypertension, uh, then it is better to have an eight hour eating window. The 10th guideline is um, keep a fast every two weeks. As I talked about earlier, it is a 36 hour fast. And once a year, do a one meal a day fast, just like uh, Navratri fast. 
11th guideline is walk 10,000 steps every day. Um, 12th guideline is sleep a minimum of seven to nine hours a day, whatever works for you. 13th is they love your family and friends unconditionally. Unconditional love is very important. And you can have a pet if that helps you. It helps body have certain flow of hormones, which are very good for health. And then the 14th is pray regularly. Who you pray to is not important, but that you pray is important, is a sense of gratitude, which flushes your body with hormones. And again, that hormone improves your health. So these are the 14 guidelines. There's no restriction in how much to eat. Rely on your body. Eat as much as you feel like. As long as the food you're eating is plant-based whole food and it is being consumed in an eight-hour eating window. Now, I had a couple of testimonials. I will skip that. Um, the second subject that I briefly wanted to touch upon was there's a lot of politics that come into play in food and healthcare matters. Um, there is a nexus which is which emerges, it is not consciously formed, but it just happens that way. The food industry wants to create food with longer shelf life. So to create longer shelf life, they want to remove the fiber, which helps them make the shelf life longer. And they want to make the food tasty, so to, because they want you to buy it again and again, and to make food tasty, they need to add sugar and butter or oil because our body evolved to crave these things. Millions of years ago, that's how we figured out what is worth eating and what is not worth eating. That's why the sensors for sweetness are at the tip of the tongue. And sensors for bitterness are at the other end of the tongue. So, so food industry adds sugar and oil to their preparations so that you would like them and they remove the fiber. Healthcare industry wants to make it easy to diagnose diseases and to prescribe medicine. So their focus is that they would like you to mop the floor. They're like the industry selling a sponge so if you are a sponge industry, you would like people to be mopping floors. You don't want them to fix their, their faucets or clogged sink. If everybody unclogged their sink and put a, a valve in their faucet, then though their floors will not be flooding anymore and sponges will not be selling anymore. So government officials just want a good job after they retire at the age of 65. And the jobs are available at the food industry, pharma industry. So they are quick to oblige them. The politicians are interested in winning the election. So they want to be on the good books of food and pharma industry because they will contribute for the election funds. Media wants to sell more magazines. So they want to make their articles more appealing and, and, uh, and, and they would rather talk about something which uh, is supported by food industry. Because when they print magazine, there was an article that I wanted to share with you was um, eat butter. You see uh, about 40 years ago, Ansel Keys did a research project in which he showed that in seven countries, 
those countries which consumed more fat, there were more heart attacks. And it became a landmark study based on which the government changed their guidelines. And in 1970s, you started seeing more and more low fat products coming to the market, low fat milk, low fat uh, cheese, low fat uh, cereal. Now, what we didn't know till about 15 years ago, when, when Ansel Keys died, they found a lot of papers in his house in Beverly Hills. And they found that the actual data he collected was for 22 countries. And that data was all over the graph. It did not prove any point. So he conveniently removed the 15 countries and made it a seven country study to prove his hypothesis, which was incorrect to begin with. So a lot of such manipulation of data goes on. Today, 92% of the research studies are funded by food industry. So if the food industry is funding the research, you know that the research findings are not likely to be um, to be against their interest. They may water down their language. And uh, so, so there are studies that show that Coke and Pepsi, if consumed in moderation, can be part of a healthy diet. Now we all know that Coke and Pepsi are very unhealthy because they have excessive amount of sugar and excessive amount of sugar is very harmful. But what I'm trying to say is that there's a lot of politics that goes on behind funding these studies or formatting the study in such a way that the results are likely to be not very negative and so on. So I think uh, one needs to be leery of this politics um, there, uh, I, I want to move on to chronic disease uh, subject, and I want to tell you that we all know that if we have high blood pressure, it is harmful to us, or high blood sugar. But one thing which we are not told, but we all know that if you take too much medicine, even medicine is harmful. There are side effects on the medicine. So, so taking too much medicine is harmful and taking, uh, having too high blood pressure is harmful. So there's a compromise. It's like a, we call it a J curve phenomena. And in a J curve on both sides, the line goes above the bottom. And there's somewhere is the bottom in the middle. And that is how most diseases work out. If you control your disease too tightly, it is bad for you because now that medication is being harmful to you. And if you control that disease in, in a very lenient fashion, and don't take any medication at all, and don't change your diet and lifestyle, then that is also harmful. So many doctors today are beginning to question the conventional wisdom of controlling all the symptoms tightly with medication. So I'll talk to you about a couple of them. And uh, the thing is, for blood pressure, for a long time, they have been saying that your blood pressure should be 120 over 80. But the current research is, and this came out in 2014, the Joint National Committee number eight, which has been setting guidelines for 40 plus years, recommended that for people under the age of 60, the cutoff point should be 140 over 90. 
So only if your BP is over 140, over 90, you should be taking medication, otherwise not. And if you are over the age of 60, then the cutoff is 150 over 90. So if you're 65 year old, 70 year old, and your BP is 147 over 89, you should not be taking medication. But many doctors don't tell you that. Because if you stop taking medication, then you're gonna stop going and seeing that doctor. Right now you go three times a year, he fills up your prescription, Every visit, maybe Medicare gives him 100 bucks and then he has another $100 from you or your secondary insurance company. All the revenue will stop. So, so it is not in their interest to talk about this modified guideline. Similarly, for blood sugar, now for blood sugar, if you go to a diabetic doctor, his target is to keep your A1C under 7.0, okay? So if it is 7.3, he wants to give you more medication and bring it down to under 7.0. If your doctor is a endocrinologist, which is a specialty, then they have a different guidelines for endocrinologists and their guideline is 6.5. So if you go to endocrinologist and your A1C is 6.6, .6, he will insist that you must continue taking medication till A1C comes below 6.5. So, so you can see the difference between an endocrinologist and a normal diabetes doctor. Now, let me tell you that two years ago, in 2018, March, a third guideline came. And this was from American College of Physicians, ACP. Now, ACP is a much larger body of doctors than the American Institute of Clinical Endocrinologists or American Diabetes Association. So they have less conflict of interest. And they said that if your A1C is under eight, you should not be taking medication. Because eight or somewhere in 7.9 to 8.1 is the sweet spot where your health will be most optimized. So, so you see the difference in three different uh, guidelines and, and, and such things happen all the time. So a lot of people are taking medication that they should not be taking. So first of all, you are following a, a guideline or you are, you are seeing a doctor which chooses to follow a stricter guideline and then he is giving you medication, which we know has side effects and is harmful. Diabetes medication causes, and many medications have been stopped. I used to take Avendia. And then Avendia was stopped because they found out that people who were taking Avendia were also developing heart diseases. So they banned the, the drug. They replaced it with Ectos. So I took Ectos for three years. Then they found out that even Ectos causes you uh, heart problems. So my diabetes doctor was so confident that I will be developing heart problems that he wanted me to go on a statin drugs, even though I had no high cholesterol problem. Similarly, the research has shown that people who take drugs for heart attack or statin drugs, they develop diabetes. So, you know, you, you take, you start with one drug, then that drug has side effects. To overcome that side effects, you take a second drug. 
And from that second drug, they, you develop other health problems, then you go to another specialist. So from your internist, you go to a endocrinologist, and then you develop kidney diseases because all these drugs have to be processed by your liver and kidney. It is important to understand that nobody dies of diabetes. People who have diabetes, they die of kidney failure or heart failure. So the doctor who is treating you for diabetes, his focus is to just keep your A1C under 7.0 and he's happy. Whether you develop heart disease and die of heart attack, he, it is not his concern. When you develop kidney issues, he said, you got to go see nephrologist. I'm not a kidney doctor. And your nephrologist now gives you even more medication. So it's a, it's a spiral. It's a very vicious spiral. And in most cases, the spiral leads to death because eventually your kidneys begin to fail and your liver begins to fail or your heart fails. And when these three organs fail, you are closer to death. Okay. So I think um, uh, I would like to allow some uh, question answer uh, period and uh, maybe uh, Rishi, you can uh, frame the question, and I could, I could answer those. I, hello. 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 Hmm. If you had a question. Q&A? Yes, let's do that. There were a few questions on the chat window, Lalit, and one of the questions was, when you talk about medication, uh, are you just referring to allopathic uh, or homeopathic or all the other strains as well? All, all, all medication. The thing, the whole concept that, uh, that you need when, when you are unhealthy, you need to take some medicine to improve your health is flawed because the medication is the, the mopping the floor. You know, Ayurveda, pro, Ayurvedic proverb is that when, when your diet is healthy, you don't need any medication. And, and, and when your diet is unhealthy, the medication is no good. So, so Ayurveda believed in having healthy body naturally. Now what has happened is because the healthy bodies don't make anybody any money. So they have Ayurvedic medicine, which is a contradiction in itself because Ayurveda honestly doesn't believe in medication. So I'm talking about all medications. You should not consume anything as a supplement or medication. If it is something, if it's a ginger that you like eating ginger, eat them. If you don't like eating ginger, don't eat it. But don't say, no, I take a piece of ginger every morning with uh, half a glass of uh, milk as a medicine. No, that is not good. That is not required. People, once they change their diet and lifestyle, within 60 days, they regain health. Most people, within 60 days. And, uh, and then you don't need any medicine. Another question? Any other questions? Uh Is uh, almond milk a good replacement for dairy? Um, all nut milks are good replacement. So almond milk, uh, oatmeal or oat milk, or soya milk, or coconut milk. These are the four that we use. There's also peanut milk and few others. So they all are good replacement, yes. 
for indian style tea or coffee oat milk is great in fact it tastes better than cow's milk it is there is a brand called oatly and you can do that or you can make it yourself is very easy just take a one cup of rolled oats with quarter cup of cashew and three cups of water and put it in the blender for 2 minutes your oat milk is ready thank you lalit ji one more uh, question uh, would be uh, oil um, and butter you know indian food preparation or in, for that matter any food preparation is is uh, is a must uh, how do you how do you overcome that well the thing is uh, um, so first of all one needs to understand that uh, the whole idea of cooking food food doesn't have to be cooked all the time food can be prepared we have to change our thinking instead of asking your wife what are you cooking tonight you got to ask what are you preparing tonight and lot of food preparations can be done which don't require cooking our goal should be to have at least half of our calories in uncooked form okay in raw form and when you when you consume the food that we talked about 1% of your body weight in fruits 1% of body weight in vegetables half of which are green and and nuts and seeds they all are uncooked and some sprouted dish, dishes sprouted moong or things like that you will find that you are consuming 50% of your calories from raw food now when it comes to cooking there are many foods cooked foods which get spoiled when you add oil to them so one example is uh, chaat we have a concept in north india chaat or idli you make idli and and idli comes out great steamed um and have idli with nariyal chutney um and if you are making dosa on a on a non stick a good quality non stick pan uh there is no oil required if you go to a vietnamese restaurant and order a soup called pho p h o pronounced pho it has no oil it is a uh, it is just uh, uh, boiling uh, water with seasonings so so that's how you eat now you can also cook food in uh, water you take 3 uh, 4 tablespoon of water and put a uh, couple of chopped onions and saute your onions in water once they are cooked add some masalas haldi mirch uh, and and add all your rajma or chole or kidney beans with lots of chopped potatoes and ginger and cilantro and everything and it comes out very tasty um so there are uh, you just go to youtube and you put down oil free cooking you will see a lot of videos that come up there is a dr chhajjar he puts his video there another approach is there is something called vegetable stock that you can make yourself and you collect all the vegetable peels for the whole week then on sunday you boil them in in a big uh, pot for 3 4 hours till the water reduces to about one third of the starting remove all the the peels from air squeeze it out and that's your vegetable stock and use vegetable stock to cook so so internet is full of recipes i all i want to say is that uh, uh, there are lots and lots of foods available which can be cooked without oil because you can add butter to it you can add cashew butter peanut butter walnut butter almond butter so so i'm not saying that don't eat fat fat is good oil is bad that's to be understood the fat is not bad a lot of people think that oil and fat the two things are synonymous no you can have all the peanuts but not peanut oil so it's that fiber that you have removed 
which causes the problem. Similarly, you can have all the sugar cane you like to eat. I, uh, there's no restriction. But the problem is with sugar. The problem is with that refining that you do. Okay, next question. Sir, I have two questions. Yes. My first, my first question is regarding fasting window. If we search in internet, every people have, have their own ways to do uh, fasting. So some says you can have green tea or you can have some kind of vegetable. No, no, okay. So the thing can... is, you need to understand some people, many people, many Indians have addiction of tea and they can't go to toilet in the morning without tea. So for them, the choice becomes either I take tea and keep 16 hour window or fasting window, or I don't take tea and keep 11 hour fasting window. So in that case, my answer is, okay, uh, have tea without cream and I mean, milk and sugar, but try to maintain a 16 hour window, okay? But uh, a lot of people you will find you can have uh, boiled water or hot water in the morning and it does the same trick. It takes about three weeks to develop new habits and give up old ones. But uh, the best thing for fasting is to only consume water and nothing else. In fact, um, tea and coffee empty stomach are very harmful. Uh, thank you. And my other question is, uh, suppose I start uh, this diet tomorrow onwards. When should I stop taking my medicine? Well, the thing is uh, that I can answer that question. It's, it's my goal in my groups is to empower you. So I have come across people when I give this talk and I, some people listen to it and and some bright people and they get the message, what's happening. And I have seen people stop medication on the very next day. Now I have seen also people make the blender. They say, oh, I'm, I'm gonna order the juicer. So let's say we are talking Saturday, Sunday morning, they stop medication, but they haven't brought the juicer. They're doing the research on internet and it says, okay, Diwali sale on 4th of November, so they're saying, okay, I'll buy on Diwali sale starting on 4th of November. Now you have stopped the medication and you, have, you haven't made any change. You're waiting for the sale to come to get a 50% off juicer. No, you first make the change. Now, if you have made the change tomorrow morning and tomorrow whole day you are following what my 14 guidelines are. After that, when you stop medication, it's totally up to you because your body has started healing, okay? So your, your hypertension has started declining. If you have started taking three glasses of juice, and of course you have stopped the animal food and ghee and oil and sugar, you have stopped. And you have started taking three glasses of juice and a eight hour eating window. These are only four changes that I say you have done. Your BP will come down in two weeks. So it's already declining that, that and, and uh, and your blood sugar will come down in 30 days. So I have seen people stop medication within a day, within a week, within a month. And then there are some, because their doctor happens to be an endocrinologist who wants to bring their A1C under 6.5, but their A1C is 6.7, <laughs> and they will not stop it till the doctor says to stop it. So my goal is to empower you. Some get empowered within a week. Some don't get empowered even in three months. It's a matter of how much reading you're doing, how much learning you're doing. When I saw that documentary and I insist that you all of you watch Forks Over Knives and the other documentaries. And then very after very next day, I started spending, I was retired. So I had nothing, nothing better to do. Instead of watching the stock market go up and down, I started watching YouTube videos by these doctors. I started spending four or five hours every day. And then that's how I acquired this knowledge, you know? Uh, so it all becomes, it's all people to people, you know? Uh, but uh, I have seen people stop medication within a day, 
because some of the medication is not even necessary to begin with. So your A1C is 7.3 and you are taking medication and American College of Physicians says that if A1C is under eight, you should not take medication. Now, how many days do you want to wait to implement that? Mm. You're already under 7.9 or 8.0. Unless you stop medication, you won't know how much it goes up. Let's say you stop medication, it goes up from 7.3 to 7.8. Well, that is still under 8.0. That means you are taking medication for nothing. It was mm. not doing anything for you. It was only increasing your risk of high all-cause mortality. That the concept they call is death for any reason. Okay, they did a study, a cord study, about 11 years ago or 12 years ago. They had to stop that study because in their group, too many people were dying. And they said, it is not fair. We need to tell these people to stop medication because the group that continued to take medication was dying in larger numbers than the group which stopped medication. So, you know, I mean, I hope I answered your question. Yeah, thank you. I Sorry, do one have last. a question. Sorry. Uh, so one last question, sorry. And one thing, what is the difference between Vitamix and Juicer, which you always tell that this, you need to bring that Juicer? Between what? B-complex? No. What is the difference between Blendtec or Vitamix? And oh, they are Blender. Juicer. They are Blender. They are not Juicer. So, so, so in, the, in, in, in the Blender, you make a smoothie. And a smoothie blender operates at high, high speed. The smoothie comes in contact with oxygen in the air and nutrients get oxidized. In a juicer, the speed is very slow, only 45 RPM or something like that. And you are crushing the vegetable to make the juice. So a juice is better than a smoothie. But a smoothie is better than nothing. Thank you, sir. I do have a question um, regarding intermittent fasting you were talking about. So um, is there, um, you say you talked about eight hour window. Uh, sorry, I joined a bit late. So uh, what is eight hour window? Well, all your food should be consumed within eight hours. And what is that? And then for 16 hour? hours after dinner till the next morning for 16 hours, you should not eat anything except water. Okay, so is it is it always good to eat at night, like before before evening? Well, dinner you can finish your dinner. Dinner is your last meal. You can finish your dinner at five o'clock in the evening, or six o'clock, or seven o'clock. You must finish your dinner before it is dark outside. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sure. I have a question. Is yes. taking ghee is good or bad? Which, what is that? Is taking ghee, ghee is good or bad? Ghee is bad. Oh, thank you. I had a question. Uh, so Lalit, you said this helped you with your sleep apnea. Was that mainly because of weight loss or it does something else also? No, no, no. This, these things do wonder. In fact, um, they, they cure diseases you... I had no hope for. I received one post today and this lady had a problem called heavy eyelid and none of the ophthalmologists were able to help her. He had, she had it for two years and, and she went and saw many eye specialists and um, and they some prescribe progressive glasses and, and 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 she is in my September group, which started on September one. I start a new group on the first of each month. And uh, on the 30th of September, the, the one month ended, and I got a testimonial this morning from her that her eyelid problem has gone away. I've had people report me that they have had sciatica problem. For 60 years, sciatica pain problem. And the sciatica goes away. Okay. So some of the things we know, of course, blood pressure will go away in two, three weeks, and diabetes will go away in one month or two months. 
Arthritis will go away in three, four months. Uh, asthma will go away within six months, okay? These things we know, but I'm talking about things that you had no clue. I, I once got a testimonial out of blue from somebody who had what is called ankylosing spondylitis. In ankylosing spondylitis, your backbone fuses. It's also known as bamboo bone. You whatever if they fuse, and, and it is a very debilitating disease, you almost become bedridden. And it is something young people get at the age of 20, 25. And he said after 25 years of ankylosing spondylitis, he has cured and he did half marathon. The thing you to understand is that your body inside has like a team of doctors, okay? Our body is very complex. To think that we know our body is flawed. We have only scratched the surface, okay? So body is all the time trying to do the best given the food that has been sent to the body. Body has no control that you are deciding what food you are feeding your body and what bed you are sleeping and what temperature. These things, from body's perspective, they are given. You have decided them, okay? But given those conditions, your body is always trying to find the best solution. So if body has increased your temperature to 103 degrees, it is because it should be increased. It's trying to fight some virus, okay? And high temperature kills the virus. Now, if you reduce the temperature down from 103 to 98, you have interfered in your body's ability to heal itself. And a lot of that goes on. A lot of doctors say to diabetic people, don't eat fruits, don't eat large meal, eat meal every two hours. What are they trying to do? They're trying to, first of all, they have assumed and convinced you that diabetes cannot be cured. Second thing they're doing is since it cannot be cured, they're applying some common sense Okay, so if I give only a little bit food at a time, my diabetes uh, will remain in check. This is totally uh, wrong. In fact, the diabetic should take the minimum number of meals. This, this uh, intermittent fasting or a narrow eating window is most beneficial to diabetes. But diabetes is resistance to insulin. If you're going to eat every two, three hours, your body will have insulin all the time. So if you are an alcoholic, alcoholic is one who has developed resistance to alcohol. So one peg does not do the job. He needs to have one peg every hour for all 12 or 14 waking hours. So to, to, to tell him that, okay, you can have one peg every hour does not cure his alcoholism. You've got to tell him that no, you cannot have alcohol, or which is like telling a diabetic, no, you have to fast. If a diabetic would fast for nine days, now rapid fast, by the time the fast ends, his diabetes will be cured. Okay. So, I mean, for diabetes, especially, the no rapid fast is, 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 a, is a godsend. It honestly is godsend. Okay. So, uh, so, so that's how it, it works. All right. I hope I answered your question. Excellent. Uh, so what we'll do is uh, it's, uh, we are a little past the 90 minutes and we can keep going, but uh, we will send you a deck uh, that Lalit presented today. We'll also send you the video. If you would, uh, perhaps you uh, came in late, you can watch the, the whole thing. And also other resources that I will get from Lalit uh, and we will send it your way. Uh -huh. So there is a, there, if you go to YouTube and you type in Lalit Kapoor or Lalit M. Kapoor, I have videos there. So I have video about the five pillars of health, which focuses on what to do, what to eat and, and how to eat. And uh, we didn't have that much time today. Then I have a video how to reverse hypertension. And, and you can see that. And, um, and, and then the other thing is, if you are interested, you can join 
you can join now. I have an October 1 group. Now I keep it open for seven days on Facebook because Facebook, if you join a few days late, you will still have access to prior postings. So if you join today or tomorrow, you can see the postings from 1st of October. The Facebook group is October 21, October apostrophe 21, make my health. And if you are interested, you can go there and submit your request. Just put down, attended your seminar today, and I will accept you. In fact, I'm accepting anybody till till the uh, 6th of October. So, so that's one way you can participate. And the other way is I will be creating the November group which will start November 1. And uh, you can send me a message. Please uh, send me a link to the November WhatsApp group. My message number is 925-284. 2581. 925-284-2581. If you send me a message, I will send you the November WhatsApp group link. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much, Lalit. Uh, we really appreciate you spending time. And uh, this is, uh, so, so my personal testimony, and I'll make it really quick. I've been following this for about uh, almost two weeks. And uh, I don't have any major health conditions, but uh, I feel a burst of energy. And people tell me that you're operating at, uh, at a different warp speed. <laughs> so they can, they can feel the change in energy that has happened with me. And I feel actually very good. The fact that I've, uh, it, it, it was a little bit painful because I love sugar. I also love milk, uh, I love ghee. But uh, having given them up, uh, it's not that bad, actually. It's uh, just a little slight tweaks in the diet. And it's, uh, I feel very good at having made that shift. And my plan is to continue with this for the rest of my life. And uh, I just feel, in, in just about two weeks, I feel that it's, been, uh, it's made a huge difference. So I will never let go this uh, plan that Lalit has proposed. So I thank you, Lalit, for showing us all the way. And, uh, and Lalit has shared his phone number. Please WhatsApp him, text him if you have any questions. I will also send you the video and anything else that Lalit will send my way, I will forward to everybody so that you have access to information. Ultimately, we are all the keepers. We have to make our own choices that will align. Uh, I was talking to a buddy today, and he said that uh, I love my fish. He, he's, a, he's a Bengali, and he cannot live without fish. And uh, these are choices that we will make, but ultimately we have to make choices that will align with, uh, with the best of health that we seek to achieve. Lalit, any final words or wisdom before we- Well, no, I, uh, I want to thank you um, for, for taking the initiative. You know, a lot of people uh, attend my, my seminars and then they go their own way. But uh, I, I think uh, it shows your dynamism that you 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 chose to create this uh, group, and I I think that's uh, um, that's a noble uh, noble work, and 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 I wish you the best, um, and and I thank you for that. Thank you, Lalit. Uh, I really appreciate. Um, uh, let's give a big round of applause for Lalit. Thank you so much, and uh, it's it's an earth shaking change. So thank you, Lalit, for showing us all the way and. Uh, uh, if anybody has questions, they can email me or, or you know, you all have my email because you received the Zoom link. Uh, please feel free to reply back, uh, but obviously go to Lalit because he's our thought leader and champ. Thank you, everybody. We'll wrap this up. Really. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, Lalit. Bye.